New alarm bells ringing tonight on the coronavirus outbreak in this country. Doctors say the virus is spread through droplets when someone coughs or sneezes. And I think the business community, it's in their interest that people actually stay home and stop the spread. For a business that can allow more employees to telecommute, we want you to do that. Hi, friends. I'm Andy Paul, host of the Sales Enablement Podcast. And I want to encourage you to listen to my brand new special six-part podcast miniseries titled Selling with Purpose. The team behind Sales Enablement Podcast and I have put together this incredible series of inspiring conversations exploring what it means to sell with a mission greater than just hitting your numbers in this era of COVID-19 and beyond. So tune in to hear from world-class enterprise sales leaders and learn how their six companies will close $50 billion selling remotely. See how they've supported essential workers with the products and services they need to stay safe and thrive during this time of crisis. Subscribe to Selling with a Purpose now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Guided selling from Ring DNA makes your entire sales team more effective by revealing exactly what reps should do and when to do it. Guided selling works by transforming sales data into a curated list of prioritized sales actions. So when reps start their day, they'll never again wonder which prospects and accounts or hot inbound leads to reach out to next. Guided selling even shifts reps' priority in response to real-time buying signals. Finally, even new reps can sell like seasoned ones. Let RingDNA be your guide to success. Learn more at ringdna.com slash guided selling. That's ringdna.com slash guided selling. As usual, particularly in the startup world, the greedy get greedier. Like they don't become less greedy. And so goals get jacked and everybody thinks it should be 200% growth year over year in a SaaS startup world. And so people are not hitting goal because the goal is outrageous. The goals are being dealt from the board down, not from the pipeline up. It's like, hey, oh, that's what your pipeline is? Great. What do we need to get this done? Go do it. And then there's this assumption that everybody hits. And then there's this assumption that I think people miss is that 100% of your sales team should not hit goal. Like if you're building your business and your goals around everybody hitting 100%, that's just not realistic at the numbers they're using right now. The company should be statistically and significantly profitable when 70% of your team is hitting goal. Hi, friends. Welcome to the Sales Enablement Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Paul. Now, that was Richard Harris. Richard's the founder of the Harris Consulting Group and director of sales training for Sales Hacker. And he's joined me today on Sales Enablement, episode 795, to have a conversation about well, sales training. It's one of my favorite topics because I believe it's the, one of the areas in sales where there's the biggest room for improvement. So Rich and I will talk about how, as the world around us has changed, uh, at least temporarily, if not forever, what impact that will have on how we should train sellers. Now, this is important for many sellers because what they do on a day-to-day basis has changed in ways that are perhaps unexpected. So now the question is, how do we enable them to succeed? We're also digging into a topic that, at least to me, is even more important than sales training in terms of being essential to the success of individual sellers. That is how we train and enable frontline sales managers. Now, this is a vitally important subject that is generally ignored in sales because, on average, I don't believe salespeople can improve any faster than their manager improves. So you'll be hearing more about this in my conversations with guests in upcoming episodes. All right. All this and much, much more. But before we get to Richard, I want to remind you to subscribe to this podcast, Sales Enablement with Andy Paul, wherever you listen to it. And if you subscribe, we'd certainly appreciate it if you could also give us your review about how we're doing in the form of a review. Thanks. Also, lastly, if you haven't connected with me on LinkedIn, please do that. LinkedIn slash in slash real Andy Paul. That's right. There's only one real Andy Paul. Let's jump into it. Richard, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much, Andy. It's good to be back. Yeah, it's it's been too long. I think that's fair to say. Oh, I appreciate it. I, I but I'm also very grateful that you you came on Scott and I Surf and Sales. So we appreciate you coming on and 
and even you've been just giving us some podcasting advice. We appreciate it. So <laughs> you guys, you guys do a great job. Thank you. Thank you. So and congratulations since the last time we spoke too on the, on your business endeavor that's happened well, thank you. with ring thank DNA. You. That's pretty, that's pretty sweet. Like I gotta, I got, I'm trying to get there. <laughs> well, I'm nice. It's nice to be a role model <laughs> for yeah. once. Yeah. 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 No, it's, uh, it's been great. It's been absolutely great. So, where have you been uh, sort of sheltering in place? So uh, shelter in place in, in Moraga, California, outside mm. San Francisco, East Bay for people who are listening, um, sort of near Ber- between Berkeley and Walnut Creek, if you know the area. I lived in Moraga. Oh, you did? Did I not I know that? I did. Well, I mean, I'm not sure I remember talking about it before, but yeah, I, I – um, uh, sort of 1980. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was a long, long time ago, but yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's really great. Where are you now? So I've, I've spent the first, you know, close to 90 days of shutdown in New York city, Manhattan. Mm. And, uh, just yesterday, my wife and I escaped from New York. If you remember that film and, I do. I'm uh, <laughs> and we're back in San Diego. So okay, wow. How was I mean? I know this is completely off time. I don't know what we're going to talk about, but how was New York? I mean, like that just must have been crazy nutty. Well, you know, it'll, I th- as I tell people, unless you're in the hospitals, you really you didn't you know really see all the drama. And the hospitals were jammed and to overflowing, right? Especially in you know we live in Manhattan, it's there, and but especially in the other boroughs, uh, Queens, Bronx, Brooklyn. Uh, things are much more dire there than than in Manhattan. How did you How did you just go down the elevator thirty floors if you lived in a high rise? Like that was like, oh, I'll wait for the next one, or you just sort of oh, put no, your mask exactly. on and risk exactly. it. Exactly, exactly. So the same thing is true here in high rise in San Diego, the, where we live. So we live in two high rises. Is that mm. yeah? The rule is you leave your apartment, you have your mask on, and you ride mm-hmm. one family, you know, mm-hmm. per elevator. So it takes it takes a little bit longer to to get down uh, yeah. to the lobby or to come up. Sometimes that people are are very good about it and hand sanitizer stations all over. And so, yeah, as a community, people people do a pretty good job. And that was true in New York. I mean, for the most part, people were wearing the masks and you know staying off public transit and and uh, you know now that it's we moved into May and people see the the opening coming. Yeah, people are starting to be a little less careful. So a little bit of concerning, but uh, yeah, by and agree. large, people do a pretty good job, and that's that's true here in San Diego as well. Well, cool. What do we want? What What are we really going to talk about today? What are we really going to talk about? Well, you know, I thought we'd talk sort of about what what you see the role of sales training. One thing is the role of sales trainings are in the next normal because it seems like we have an opportunity to sort of do a a reset to some degree, right? Um, or an evolution, not necessarily call reset, but an evolution mm-hmm. because you know, we started this show with the mission saying, look, is for our purposes, we define sales enablement as you know, enabling sellers with the the knowledge, the skills, the tools, the content. So basically anything and everything that they need in order to have knowledge-based conversations with buyers that the buyers feel are valuable. Mm-hmm. Not that the seller thinks are valuable, <laughs> the buyer thinks are valuable. Right. And right. and so, you know, training certainly plays a role there. Um, but as we see perhaps sales evolving, and we've seen it evolve pretty consistently over the last 15 years or so. But yeah, you know, there's always been the sort of undercurrent, which is yeah, okay, the last seven, eight years, sales performance seemingly is falling, you know, based on sort of various data points we get from, you know, CSO Insights and other people. They're data points, so let's take them for what they are. I mean, it's it's not so that they're gospel, but an indicator. Um, you know, it somewhat mirrors the fact that productivity in our economy has, has slowed, productivity growth has slowed down pretty substantially mm-hmm. over the last 10 years, even though we've been introducing all this new technology. I presume sales sort of mirrors that. There's no reason to believe sales productivity growth hasn't also slowed over this time. So like, I think that... Okay, what, what's, what are we ruling? What's happening? So I'll go back to the, to the first thing, I think. 
One, I think the goals have been outrageous. We've had a great booming economy, right? Which is good. I think that's been robust and it's been fantastic. But as usual, particularly in the startup world and even in other worlds, you know, the greedy get greedier. Like they don't become less greedy. And so goals get jacked and everybody thinks it should be 200% growth year over year in a SaaS startup world. <laughs> um, you know, of course. And, and so people are not hitting goal because the goal is outrageous. The goals are being dealt from the board down, not from the pipeline up. Right. It's like, hey, oh, that's what your pipeline is. Great. What do we need to get this done? Go do it. And then there's this assumption that everybody hits. Um, and then there's this assumption that, that I think people miss is that 100 percent of your sales team should not hit goal. Right. Like if you're building your business and your goals around everybody hitting 100 percent, that's just not realistic at the numbers sure. they're using right now. You know, the company should be statistically and significantly profitable when 70% of your team is hitting goal, right? If you're not statistically and significantly profitable, then the goals are out of whack. And some of it could be personnel. Some of it could be product market fit, but it's not this, oh, we need to fire this the, the VP of sales. So that's part of it. Well, and we're going to get to that because, yeah, the expectations for... Our VPs are insane. Yep, and they've but they've always been insane. I'll I'll start there, but we'll get back to that. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, so that's where I see us, you know, sort of coming from is that look every look pigs get slaughtered, right? We you know this. Everybody's being a little piggy, and it's and it's taken COVID to get us there. Um, so in some ways, that's a little bit nicer, but it's also a very convenient excuse. Right. Um, and and I, you know, I'm, I'm old enough and you're old enough to say, look, I remember what happened in 2008. Are you <laughs> sure I'm not that old? Yeah. yeah. I remember what it was like in 2001. You know, I've, I've lived through two of these things and I know that that this stuff happens. Um, but, you know, 2008, the excuse was the banks. 2001 was, you know, 9-11. Um, and, and that's just the way it sort of works, right? Like that's what we know about economies. Um, so I think that's, that's the challenge we're in right now. What I think people have forgotten, I'm not sure when you're going to release this, but you know, we've survived Q2 decently as we come out of COVID and we're starting to see people do stuff, but the economy lags about six months behind reality. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, unemployment's going up. Yeah. Um, you know, July is going to be a very tough month, I think. For a lot of businesses, unfortunately, you know, uh, we're not out of the woods yet, so to speak. So it'll be an interesting play on where this goes the next six months, you know? Well, I think, yeah, I guess one of the things I was driving at is, is do we really understand yet, you know, the, the levers that we can manipulate to move the needle on individual performance? I mean, I, 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 th I think I we're think getting way better, you know? Well, but I'm. I mean, one of the things that that I look at is is just based from experience over the years is that yeah we are in a performance based profession, and mm -hmm. who do you know that's been trained on how to coach performance? Not how to just coach, but how to coach performance. You know, mm -hmm. when you go into professional sports, there are people they they've been trained how to coach performance out of yeah. athletes. Well, we've got business athletes. Um, who knows how to do that? And this gets back to your point before about the VPs of sales. Is is you know my belief is that we fund at a fundamental level. We're still managing sales the same way we did a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've got this. We've got this VP, CRO, whatever we want to call them. And the assumption is, well, they're in that position. They know all that stuff, right? They know how to coach performance. They know, you know, how to do the things that'll move the needle. They are an expert in training. They're an expert in personal development. You know, go down the list. Mm -hmm. And that's incredibly unfair because they're not expert in, in probably any of them. <laughs> so yeah, no, I completely agree. And and it's interesting because um your new CEO, Howard, um, and I have talked about this a little bit and I'm even doing something with the the ring DNA 
uh, event that's coming up yeah. on the Peter Principle, very specifically to this, which is the short version is the Peter Principle is that the reason people fail is because they're promoted into positions where they don't have any skill set. Right. Now, this is for people listening. This this was was published in the 70s, maybe 60s yeah. or 70s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's been around it was very a while. popular, but people don't talk much about it. But basically, people mm-hmm. rise to the level of their incompetence is the, mm-hmm. the theory behind it. Yep. And so, and then there are the people who excel because then they recognize they're self-aware and they try to go get the knowledge, right? Great organizations. And, and, you know, this is sort of that old school IBM Xerox kind of place. Well, they had leadership programs built in. They taught you those things. And that's the stuff that gets shortcutted or shortcut shortcut. Mm-hmm. In the startup world, right? We don't have time for that. Well, every world these days, not just startups. That's that's all over. I agree. So, 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 but this is the part where I think people are getting better, um, because we do have. First of all, we have coaching is now a good word. It used to be sort of a weird word for my generation. You know, when when you said coaching to a Gen Xer, it it felt like micromanaging because nobody knew how to be a coach. To your point these professional sales athletes. Um, and, and now, you know, with things, you know, like ring DNA and course and gong and, you know, those tools are giving us the ability to actually coach. And that's really important. Um, and it's opened our eyes to the ability to coach. And now we're going to figure out how to coach. Now we know what to coach. Now we got to talk about how do we teach someone to be a good coach? Right? Exactly. How do we coach the coach? Exactly. And so I'm starting to see that stuff uh, come out more and more. And then, you know, in my sales training stuff that I do and my management stuff that I do for training, it's the, the principles are all the same, right? It's understanding, you know, I still ask, I still know how to use open and closed into questions if I'm managing a person versus navigating a deal. I still know how to use mirroring if I'm having a conversation Right. I still know mm-hmm. how to use labeling and all these other techniques, you know, multiple choice questions. We just never really been taught how to use it. And, and salespeople, in fact, we're taught to ignore our emotions. Don't worry about it. Right. Don't take it personal. Well, wait a minute. I actually want to take a personal for a minute. <laughs> I want to be well, yeah. <laughs> right. So, um, so we kind of have to sort of, you know, hopefully I don't date us too much. You have to sort of, you know, you keep saying us. I know, I know. I, I do that to Scott too, even though he's ten years younger than me. I, you know, but you have to George Costanza it and sort of do everything the opposite, right? Op- be opposite George. Opposite day, yeah, right. Yeah. So, um, I'll, I'll stop there. I'm sure you got another question <laughs> somewhere. Well, but it speaks to several questions I wanted to dive into. Is, is so this idea about. You know, we're still managing sales fundamentally the way we have, mm-hmm. which is not not very efficiently. And you know, we have sort of this hero complex we imbue the the sales leader with. Uh, but then, yeah, we've got these these managers that, given the lack of training that exists basically across the board, except for some of these legacy big companies. Yeah, I was interviewing an author who had written about first time management jobs. And he cited research that showed, well, I'll ask you a question. So what age, at what age does a manager typically receive their first leadership training? I would guess, I would guess late thirties, early forties. Yeah. 42. <laughs> yeah. And I think, I think the number was that on average they'd been in management like 10 years before they get their first training. And then you you know it's you know hey, was, there, you. was there any answer to why that existed? Like that's fascinating to me. Well, I think that there's just this assumption that if we promote people into these positions, they know this stuff, mm-hmm. and they don't. I mean, I look yeah. at, at I look at what's changed, and again, people listen to the show. I've heard me say this more than once. Is that, and I may have said and said it when we talked to you guys on your show is, was yeah, I love looking at what they're doing in professional sports. You look at the coaching staffs; they compri- are comprised of specialists. Yeah, you know, I've got a, I've got a mental performance specialist. I've got a you know physical fitness 
specialist. I've got a, you know, all these coaches that have these specialized training and various aspects of the job to improve the performance of these well compensated athletes. Yep. And yet at sales, we've we've specialized aspects of the selling role, which makes a ton of sense. And yet we get to management, we expect this frontline manager and a sales director and a sales VP to have all this specialized knowledge, which they don't have. And we wonder mm-hmm. why salespeople aren't getting better. And you managers quick to point the finger at salespeople and say, well, you know, they're lazy, they're not learning, or, you know, why do salespeople have a bad reputation? And, and I look yeah. at that and I say, well, the reason they have a bad reputation is because, well, I'll give you an example. <laughs> it's because of the bad reputation of the leaders. Ex- well, because because of the leaders, right? When we, when I was growing up, not to date you or me unnecessarily, as if there was a kid you were playing with and your parents said, yeah, we don't want you to play with John anymore because, you know, he badly behaved. Mm-hmm. The next sentence was always, yes, parents are bad, right? Bad parenting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, isn't that what we have a huge case of in sales? It's just bad parenting on the part of managers. <laughs> oh, God, yes. I love that. I mean, I mean I think that's a that's, great post. I think that's what we're, what we're really dealing with here. So, I mean, let me throw it to you as, as a professional sales trainer. It's just increasingly sort of occurs to me as, as you know, I've seen this number. We spend $20 billion a year on sales training in the United States, of which I think Roughly 5% or something is spent on training managers. What if we flip that on its head? Mm-hmm. What, what would happen to sales if we flipped that on its head and spent $19 billion training the managers and a billion training the sellers? Yep. It'd be interesting to see what happens there. I, I mean, my, agree. my belief is things would get better. I agree. It, it would be because there's two parts to that too, right? There's the, there's the aspect of teaching the managers how to manage humans, right? In yes. a humane way. And right. then there's the tactical sales training, right? Like how do we mm-hmm. actually, you know, what do we need to teach them to say and how to say it? So, um, which is what all management is right now. Management is teach them what to say, go do what Johnny did, right? Well, yeah. And that's sort of, sort of what the coaching turns out to be is, you know, the tools are great, but if we just use them to tell people to be like somebody else, as opposed mm-hmm. to let's use the tools to coach you to be the best version of you, then we're not using the tools the way they, you know, could be used optimally. Totally agree. Totally, totally agree. But don't, don't you think that managers, you know, they've sort of taken the fact we have these metrics and access to data and greater transparency in our processes and sort of default to try and manipulate those as opposed to doing just the really hard work of coaching and mentoring and being a role model, modeling the behavior they want people to exhibit with their sellers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, the greatest thing that, you know, the greatest management tool I know is what do you think you should do? Pretty simple. Right. Mm-hmm. And then that, then that's the kickoff to the conversation. That doesn't mean that, that the manager's done, but now you can be, you can meet that rep in their space, in their own mindset, and then you can help work their, help them work their way out of the paper bag. Exactly. Don't show them how to get out. <laughs> right. Help, help them learn how to get out of the paper bag. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep, totally. So, uh, so that that's, and I think it's hard too because traditionally speaking, the the sales person who becomes the sales manager is aggressive, and not in a negative way, but you know they're I, look, they're impatient for success. Let's define mm-hmm. aggressive that way. They're impatient for success. Um, they don't like to take time on anything, much less talking to somebody, right? Human, you know, in in sort of sure. a coaching and mentoring way, and so they don't know how to navigate their own emotions much less anybody else's, um, which is, again, is one of the things I love about Howard over at Green DNA is he, he gets it. So Boy, he's, a, um, he's a clinical psychologist. <laughs> exactly. Right. Like, so we're, you know, that's the whole piece of it. So, but that brings me to another point though, is, is, is if we look at this, this, you know, whole idea of specializing management functions, why don't we just have coaches? You know, why does a manager have to coach because nobody, be, oh, why that's not, easy. Why not, now, why not hire people who are professional coaches? Mm-hmm. That's an easy, easy thing to do. There's an easy answer to that. Okay, give it Sales, 
Yes, it's I blame it on the executive suite never carrying a bag for real. Ever. Yeah, well that I agree. That's that's one that's one of two parts. I agree a hundred percent. So that's that's a big piece of it, is that they don't and here's what that really means is that particularly for founder CEOs in, in the startup world, is they completely forget that your early stage deals, your first 10 customers, you know, maybe they're friends and family, maybe not. But those first 10 customers were buying you, the CEO, and your dream and your vision and your emotion and passion, right? It's, it's, you know, it's just like Shark Tank. You've seen episodes where they're like, I don't know that's the right product, but I, I'll buy you. I'll buy you because I trust that you know what you're doing and we just got to find you the right product. Right. And CEOs and CFOs forget that and they think it's transferable and they think it's a commodity. And, um, you know, they think... And, and, and to a certain extent, the salespeople have allowed themselves to get beaten up over this. Um, I did for a very long time too. So um, so that that's a huge piece is they don't really know what sales is like. And it's seen as a cost center. Yeah. Right. Um, and and you can measure the tenure of every other department versus sales. And if you said, well, what if we had that same turnover in marketing? What would happen? If we had that same percentage of turnover in engineering, what would happen? And that's the challenge that I think people don't get. Um, and they, they, you know, I would, I would love for any CFO or CEO who's listening to this to call me. You know, my cell phone's 415-596-9149. Call me, and I will gladly debate you and win on this topic. So there you go. So that's how passionate I am about it. Yeah. Well, I am too. So I I've I have this blog piece I've been working on for a long time, but and I, I've got one of two titles for it. I, I can't remember, or I haven't chosen one. So the first one is CEOs don't know shit about sales performance. And the second, the second version was CEOs don't give a shit about sales performance because they don't. I mean, here we have this revolution taking place in business, and I'll say the business of sports and how we how these billion dollar organizations, enterprises, are getting serious about performance of the people that they're paying that are making the difference in their product, and yet, yeah, we don't do any of that. And to your point, it's looked at as a cost center. Yeah. I would I would suggest you go with the they don't know anything about sales. I would because <laughs> I think you'll offend more people and get them to pay attention. Yeah. Because I don't know that CEOs don't care about sales. I think they do care. I think they care about the revenue number, but they don't care about how you get there. Yeah. Right? Well, that's they, what they I mean. Try to pretend like they don't want to know about the sausage, right? You yeah. Know? Um, you could certainly change it to something. You know. You know you can't like sales unless you, you can't understand sales unless you understand how the sausage is made. That's too long, but it's the same process. It's the same piece. Yeah, you know, it's. I think this is. You look at really the the barriers, and this is really this is a big one, right? It's it's yep. until I don't think we can really fundamentally transform individual sales performance until we first transform sales managers. And for that to happen, we have to transform higher level sales leadership. Yep. Completely agree. And until such time, it, it just feels like we're sort of trying to push a wet noodle up the hill with our nose. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So what do you think the answer is then? So what, what is, let's, let's flip it. Um, what do we think, what would that performance coach look like? Right. What would that, that man or woman be what, what would we want them coaching on? Well, yeah. So let's 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 go back to. Let me ask you a question because this will relate to it mm-hmm. directly. Take us to it. Is is because I ask this increasingly now of guests on the show is who taught you how to sell? Uh, um, so I'm different, right? I, I'm I'm a special snowflake. Uh, both my parents were in sales growing up, so sure. it was so to a certain extent. Some of it just came through osmosis. But when you're on the job. Um, Yep. Um, my, well, so my first sales job was at a company called, well, at a company called, the, was at The Gap. And the first All sales process. to The Gap. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> um, you just dated yourself. So. <laughs> um, but their, their sales process that I still know was called Gap Act. Greet, approach, product knowledge, add on, close, and thank you. 
And so that was my first attempt at sales. Mm-hmm. Now that's, that's retail it's inbound, but they taught us to understand, well, what are you looking for? What kind of ideas we had to memorize all the color names, you know, we had to, um, you know, know what matched with what so that we could, you know, add on and upsell, right. All those kinds of things. So for me, that is the first place I learned. I don't think I got good at it till I was 10 or 15 years later. Um, I was not the student of sales that I see people being now. Um, and, and I think that was probably my own ego more than anything there, you know, the books were there, you know, I just didn't know Mm -hmm. to go look for them or didn't want to go look for them. Yeah. In my case, it was really two people, one of my first boss, but you know, what he did is, is we just talked a lot about the deals I was working on, but not in a, you know, detailed do this, do that, but just to your question before. So what are you thinking about this deal? Mm-hmm. Right, and we went out on a lot of calls together, and and it was just that being there, role modeling, modeling the behavior. You know, sometimes we'd go on calls, and yeah, people say, "Oh, don't let the boss do it." It's like, or take the lead, but yeah, sometimes they just. It was great to do that because I learned so much from watching them give the pitch, answer objections, you know, do the things that that it's like, oh. I won't do it that way, but I could. I understand what I'm missing now and what I'm doing. Yeah, and I think that just modeling the behavior seems to be missing so much these days. Well, because partly it's the, the way nature of the way we sell, but we need to. Mm-hmm. It seems like we need to bring more of that back in because like people, people learn by observing other people. You know, for me, is in order of hierarchy is I learned from my boss and mentor. Uh, top second was peers. Third was, I learned from my customers. I learned a ton from my customers about how to sell. And fourth was training. Yep. So it's interesting because I see it a little bit differently. I don't know that we, I think we're racing too hard to the, go listen to this call. Here's a perfect call. I think that's good, but I still think there's, you know, you still have to take your swings and at bats, right? You still, you know, in that sports analogy, you still have to, you know, Serena's still got to get on the court and practice. Repetition. She, Repetition. I mean, let's face it. She's 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 Serena Williams, and you know, greatest female athlete, if not all athletes, um, with what she's been able to do in her career. But she still has to get back to the practice. And she has a coach on the court on the court, though. In her practice, she has a coach on the court. So exactly. Every day. Entirely. Yep. Yep. One hundred percent. Well, it gets back to this idea of is when. This sort of popular whole idea about you know ten thousand hours mastery of anything with ten thousand hours of practice. Yeah. I think people miss sort of the the critical point was it wasn't really the ten thousand hours. It was that you practiced with active direct feedback, so that you know as you were practicing, as you're learning, you were, had the involvement of someone that was giving you the feedback about, hey, have you tried this? Have you thought about this? And so on. Mm-hmm. That's what drove people to learn. It wasn't the 10,000 hours without the coaching, without the deliberate direct coaching, they could have gone 20,000 hours, not mastered it. So it wasn't about the level of effort. It was about the effort with feedback. So I I completely agree. And I think that's the part that's missing, but I think we're to what we were saying a few minutes ago. um, That's the part where we're getting back to, right? We're now recognizing that, because of you know the ring DNA tools, right, where you can record the call and, and go back and coach to the call. What's now lacking and what's what's become apparent is we don't know how to teach the coach to coach the rep. Yeah. Right. We don't te- we don't need to teach them that kind of stuff. So that's where I think it's really got to come in. Um, in fact, I would I would I would say you know have you talked to Matt Cameron before on the show? Uh, no, I know Matt, but I've not. No, we've not had him on the show. I would, I would encourage you to have him because, you know, he runs a management program, um, very different than mine. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but he has his fingers on the pulse of this stuff at a, at a very intimate level. And I think he'd be a great, all right. Great suggestion. Great conversation. And, and if you, I'm more than happy to make an introduction. Oh, but, no, I, I know Matt. Yeah. So, um, because I think that's, you know, we've been talking about what sales going to be like, what's training going to be like, what's coaching going to be like, well, what about sales management? Because can you define what sales is going to be like if you haven't defined what sales management is? To your point of flipping everything on its head, 
stop spending the money on just the training, spending more on coaching, right? That's a really important piece and comes full circle. Yeah. I mean, I'll think about a sales organization. I mean, I, I love this example is for people that watch the show Billions uh, about a hedge yep. fund. Yeah. Who's the key? Who's the key employee? Right. Wendy, the shrink. Yeah. The shrink. Oh, I loved her. Yes. Right. But totally. totally. For a large sales organization, why wouldn't you have somebody like that? This is your mindset specialist coach. Right. Right. You can't right. expect a sales manager to be that person. Yet we do. Without any training, mm-hmm. we expect mm-hmm. you to be, you know, read a couple articles, listen to a podcast, and you're an expert on mindset. Well, that's, that's BS. It doesn't work that way. Same thing with performance coaching. There are people that yep. train performance coaches. Why can't we change the way we staff sales, other than the roadblock put up by CEOs? Is <laughs> say, yeah, you've got a frontline manager. They take care of certain aspects of, right? They could be personnel management. It could be forecasting. It could be... Yeah, budgeting, it could be hiring. But when it comes to personal development, yeah, we've got one or two specialized coaches on staff, and that's all they do. And so there's none of this. You know, we published a, a podcast episode today with uh, talking with Pat Rogers from Loop about uh, sales management survey they had done that, you know, is that 85% of sales managers say coaching's top priority. 28% of sales reps said they get any coaching at all. Yeah, I've seen that report. Right, yep. so so we happen. got this huge gap. Well, screw the gap. Let's make I can go make it go away tomorrow by hiring people on staff. That that's all they're supposed to do. Yep, I completely. So agree. none of this excuse about oh the bosses need me to put together reports and I got to pay so much attention to the KPIs, and make sure I'm hitting our metrics. It's like yeah, yeah, go do that. You're the manager. We'll get some coaches. They'll take care of the sellers. Yeah, it's interesting. I think you know if you think about the operations function, I think. My belief that my hypothesis is the operations function is meant to do that. But then what that also does is it exposes the weakness of the actual sales leader because they still don't know how to go coach. <laughs> well, <laughs> they're still sitting behind being a dashboard manager. Right. You know? And that's why they resist changes like this. And you've, I'm sure you've seen mm-hmm. this as a consultant. I certainly have seen it as a consultant. Is, yeah, I, I, my clients are always just CEOs, not VPs of, of sales or CROs, because as soon as I set foot in the door, they go into defense mode. Well, the fact they're bringing mm-hmm. Andy in must mean that I'm deficient somehow. And it's like, yep. it's not that you're deficient bad. They're bringing me to help you. Yeah. I've seen that shift. So I've seen that shift a lot in the last couple of years, at least in my world, right? Because once they come to me, it, it's it's they're usually on board. Right. And the, the, the story I'm hearing is, um, hey, this is great. I've never seen it or taught it that way. Or, you know, hey, we just need a different voice. Right. We need to hear something different um, in told in a different way that connects with people gener- across generations. Um, and so the VPs of sales, at least for what I do, typically don't feel threatened. They often feel relieved. Or I'm getting happy years. So uh, I've never, you know, I've never, nobody's ever, you know, this, this should be my talk, talk, should, talking behind your I back. Do, no, I should go, I should go and look at all my clients in the last two years and see how many of them still have the same sales leader. And then if, you know, if it's a really good percent, like 90% of my VPs of sale are still there 18 <laughs> months later. <laughs> that's the, part of your that's marketing pitch. Blowing. That's your marketing pitch. Right. There's my pitch. Right. <laughs> So um, I'll help. Well, I've I've had that conversation with with VPs. I said, "Yeah, I'm here to make sure you don't get fired." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I say that a lot. I, I say to people a lot is like, "I know this is eyes are on you. I know it's a big decision, and I promise I won't do anything to make you look bad." Right? And and I you can, can do that hear, all on your own. You don't need me to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And and I can hear their exhale. Of like, okay, thanks. Particularly if it's a new VP, right? Someone who's trying to, they're either a new VP in the role or they're new at the job, right? Like they've they've been a VP, but now they're new and, you know, they've got the weight to throw around um, and to prove themselves. So it's important for that. I I think that's, I think, I think that's what people like about what I do is they, they feel like I really have their back and that's what, you know, my G2 stuff says, but. um, Well, yeah. You you got a bunch of those stars on G two, yeah. Um, but I think that's what people need. So I think it's that humanity. I think Tim Clark at Salesforce um, 
and Uncrushed, who I've done stuff with, is, you know, he did, we did an episode with him and his whole thing is like, how do we bring humanity back into sales? And when you stop and think about it, a lot of people race to, yeah, how do I be more human with my prospect? And I'm, and, you know, Tim and I are like, well, yeah, but how do we be more human with our employees? <laughs> like, how do we make sure we're not just making it about the number, right? Um, I don't know who said it, but somebody has said it that, you know, you know, made it to president's club does not go on your tombstone, right? Like that's not what it's, <laughs> like no. that's, it's not that important. No. Right. So, yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's a big, a big task, but I think that one of the things on the human element that that's just our sighing about is that, you know, we talk about that, but by the same token, we look at the expectations for like onboarding programs mm -hmm. and, and, I remember reading this quote from uh, a soccer coach in, in the UK, a Premier League coach, and he's saying, "We before we train the soccer player, we train the human." Mm -hmm. And I thought, "Oh, that's brilliant, right?" That's really good. Before we train the soccer player, we train the human. And we, again, to your point, we don't do that at all in sales. You don't give people that support at all about. You know, a perfect example with our onboarding programs, you know, 90 days, you got to be up to speed. And and this coach went on to say, he says, you know, one of the things we're really sensitive to is everybody matures at different rates. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. he said, there's almost always a moment with the top players where suddenly they get it. But the moment they get it could be month one for one player. It could be month 18 for another player. And yet yeah. for us, if somebody's past 90 days and they don't really get it, yeah, they're not going to be around very long. And so we we don't this whole point of being human is we don't account for any human differences in people. This is for me the part that's gotten worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I completely agree, and and I think we're about to see it now. Like I think it's it's with what's happening in COVID and and where it's going to take us is the mediocrity is being weeded out um, to a certain degree. Unfortunately, there's a lot of mediocre people in positions of influence and they're <laughs> protecting themselves and they're trying to weed out they're, they're weeding they might be weeding out the wrong mediocrity sure everybody's, everybody's got a built-in excuse now right so um and that you know i've talked to a couple of people and, and they've shown me their leaderboard and they're number one or number two and they're the ones who are getting let go from COVID. and i'm like wait a minute like i i'm like i'm really sorry but be glad you're not working for that leader anymore. Well, yeah. Why? So why were they being let go? That's amazing. Yeah. I have no idea. I have no clue. Like they were, you know, the, Oh, the, well, the excuse was we have to downsize. Like we have to COVID it. Like it's the COVID thing. I'm like, okay, but who are they keep? Did they keep people or did they let go of the whole team? No, they kept people. So now there's favoritism. Right. There's, I don't know that's nepotism in most of the companies I work with. No, it's favoritism. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's there. That's a whole nother book. Somebody needs to write. I mean, it's like mm -hmm. if salespeople think they're playing on a level playing field, it's just not the case. And this is what, another thing. Totally. Yeah. You know, when we talk about performance and sales as an aggregate, it's, you know, what, what account for a lot of the individual variations? Yeah. People getting fed, fed the better leads, better territories, better accounts. We can just go down the list. But that's another day. We'll have to solve that one. Totally agree. All right. Well, Richard, running out of time, yeah. as always, been a pleasure. We won't wait so long the next time to do it. And yes. uh, people want to connect with you. What's the best way to do that? Well, uh, e easiest is LinkedIn, right? Like Richard Harris. I'm the guy who, you know, hacked and trademarked his name, even though you can't legally do it. That's how you'll find me. <laughs> um, and then, you know, you can find me at Richard at rharris415.com is my email address. And, um, you know, I gave out my cell phone, but here it is again, 415-596-9149. Nobody ever calls me. That's why I love giving it out. All right. So, so audience, let's let's prove them wrong. Yeah. Somebody pick up the phone and call Richard. And text me. Yeah, I'll or take text, the call. text, yeah. I'll take it. Be yeah. modern. Perfect. So, All right, Richard. All right. It's fun, Andy. I really appreciate the time. It's always good to catch up with you. Always. I'm going to look forward to doing it again soon. All right. Talk to you later. Okay, friends, that's it for this episode. First of all, I want to thank you for taking the time to listen. I'm so grateful for your support of the show, and I want to thank Richard Harris for sharing his wisdom with us today. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to this podcast, Sales Enablement with Andy Paul, on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to this podcast. 
And if you could also leave us a rating or a review and let us know how we're doing, we'd really appreciate it. You can do all that on your phone in less than a minute as soon as this podcast is over. So thanks for your help. And thank you again so much for investing your time with us today. Until next time, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. RingDNA is the leading sales enablement platform that uses AI to help scale business growth. Trusted by the top companies across the globe, RingDNA offers a suite of powerful tools for every sales role. The RingDNA dialer radically improves sales productivity and call connection rates, while guided selling helps reps know exactly what to do and when to do it. Conversation AI uses artificial intelligence to surface the most impactful coaching opportunities in real time. So no matter where your team is working from, the RingDNA platform can help them exponentially increase call connections, opportunities, and revenue. Learn more at ringdna.com slash platform. That's ringdna.com slash platform.